talking about how you learn to install some marketing and the price of the All right. So, um, for those of you, I, I feel like I probably know about half of you out there. But for those of you I don't know, um, I'm Justin Ferguson. I am the leader of the local OWASP KC chapter. OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. Uh, we try to sort of bridge the gap between security folks and developers. And I am also a senior application security engineer at New Services, which is a big office startup based out of San Francisco. Stick right here. Um, I, am, I am a maker, a dad, the all trades. And if you want to find me, those are the simplest ways to do so. Oh, okay, we have a microphone. Let's see if I can do this. <laughs> You're much sexier. Well. <laughs> testing, testing. Okay. Is that better? There you go. Okay. So, um, I have spent probably in the past, almost the past 20 years doing some combination of security, application development, and system administration, and have pretty much been full-time in any in most of those roles at some point. Um, so I pretty much refer to myself as cross-functional. I've worked at large companies, hundred thousand plus to small startups, the like I'm working at now, they're less than fifty. And I generally spend a lot of my time immersed in the security community outside of work. So, we're going to talk for a minute about buzzwords. Um, buzzwords, we all love them. Um, as security professionals, we tend to be pretty buzzword resistant. We, we tend to hear something repeated over and over and over again and go, that's just a buzzword, that's crap. Um, but that's not a bad thing, always. But we all have dealt with management. We've all dealt with folks who are not buzzword resistant. And so we all know this cycle. Management hears about new technology. New technology is going to save us everything. Deploy it all right now. <laughs> it sits, collects dust or gets pwned. <laughs> and so suddenly management hears about newer technology. <laughs> and we repeat this cycle. That's, we've all been there. But let's take the example of web application firewalls. Any of you who have, were doing InfoSec, you know, eight or ten years ago, probably heard this, this statement. Uh, we'll just deploy WAFs and we don't need to worry about application security. It, it's, it's all good, right? Well, yeah, not so much. Um, but that doesn't mean that WAFs are a useless technology. Just, just because they got overhyped and overused, they're still a useful technology. They can be used for mitigation of individual attacks. They can be used for defending against the script kitties. That's, I mean, that's a big thing right there. And they can be used for the all important checking boxes on compliance forms. <laughs> so, my point here is sometimes Buried in the buzzwords, there's a good idea. And those good ideas can tend to get disregarded as hype if you hear that buzzword too much. It's like it's like when you got a good song on the radio, but then the radio plays it over and over and over again, you get tired of it. <laughs> so that brings us to DevOps or DevSecOps, which I'm sure nobody will argue with the fact that DevOps and DevSecOps are the buzzwords of the year, um, at least for the past couple of years. You know, I, I work for a San Francisco-based company. You can't walk half a block in San Francisco without tripping over a DevOps company. It just happens. Um, they're worse than Starbucks. And so that oversaturation of hype leads to, especially InfoSec people who are somewhat snark prone in the first place, 
to be extra snarky about the idea of DevOps in a lot of cases. So, and I'm going to use the term DevOps and DevSecOps kind of interchangeably here. Um, there, there are some differences, but DevSecOps basically is rolling the security component into the DevOps concept. But I don't want to say DevSecOps every time I say it, so it's, uh, I'll just use DevOps. So, you know, we security people, I've heard all of the commentary about DevOps and probably said a lot of it. Um, oh, well, we're just going to give the devs access to deploy whatever they want. We're going to let the sysadmins make firewall changes? Oh, hell no. You want to just deploy stuff in the middle of the day all the time? No. You're going to let those security guys into the code repo? You don't want to do that. that that's, <laughs> we've all heard those, those comments. That's, and many of us have made those comments. So, that's not what DevOps is about. <coughs> it may involve some of those concepts, but not in the uncontrolled fashion that, that those comments are thinking of. So, what if there is some buried treasure in, in, that, in all that hype? It, it might not be revolutionary. A lot of it might seem like common sense, but a lot of it may be a route to make things better for security people, better for developers, better for ops teams, which means it's better for everybody. So, A lot of the classic view of information security is we're going to go hack all the stuff. That, that's, that's what we do. But I'm sure that most of you out there probably don't view it that way now. It's probably more like secure all the things rather than, rather than just breaking all the stuff. Security, you know, blue team work is, is probably even more prevalent than red team work in a lot of cases. In, security world. So how do we go about securing all the things? Well, we want to do these things. And yeah, they, they sound really boring, but they're really the core of creating secure applications, secure systems, and secure environments. So, who here can tell me who's familiar with the term of moving security to the left? Wow. Okay, I figured we'd get more than that. More than that. So, okay. So, moving security to the left, again, it seems obvious, but if you view your software development life cycle, and I didn't get a slide uh, of Rick's going to this one. Um, <clears throat> moving security to the left, if you, view, if you view your software development life cycle as a set of steps, you start out over here in design. Your second phase is actually writing the code, developing the code. Usually that testing code kind of goes along with that. Then you go into deployment. Then you go into maintenance. Well, in a, in a classical security model where security is not well engaged with the development team, security doesn't really hit until about the point where maybe if you're lucky, it's in the testing phase. If you're not lucky, it ends up being in the, oh, that code's running and somebody just hacked it phase. Well, moving security to the left is the idea of moving that security engagement with the software development life cycle back to the left in that, in that process. And the reason for doing that is that research has shown that it can be up to 100 times cheaper to fix a problem in each previous phase than it was in the, in the next phase. So if a problem is discovered in a deployed app, it costs 100 times what it would have cost to fix it if it had been discovered in testing. 
And same thing for design. It, it makes a huge difference in your security perspective. So that's what I mean by moving security to the left. And that's what a lot of what DevSecOps is trying to do, is move security to the left. So <clears throat> all of these things together, those are what, what along with you know, a lot of other concepts, that it's only a 25-minute talk, so you know, didn't want to get too in-depth. Um, those are what makes up DevSecOps. So, the big question now is how. Um, I promised some actionable insight, so we're going to try and do some of that. Um, I'm going to try and provide some ways that you as security people, or you as developers, or you as operations teams, how many folks in the audience are, are security, security focused? Most of you. How many are development or operations? Got a few. Okay, good. Um, so, we're going to try and provide ways that you guys can make these changes incrementally from internal and be thought leaders in your organization without having to get immediate upper management buy-in. <clears throat> we're also going to try and provide some ideas, I guess I'm going to try and provide some ideas, of low-cost tools. Um, low or no cost tools that you can use to implement these things in your environment today. So, I know most of you out there are going to be going, well, I'm a security guy, not a developer, and so I don't want to be involved with development teams. Well, that's, you got to keep an open mind. Um, that, that's really rule number one for security people. If you can't keep an open mind when it has to do with working with your developers, you might want to think about being in a different field, or you might want to think about being at least in a different role. So, so learn. And I'm not saying go sit down and start hammering out code. That, that's not the answer here. The answer is go sit down with your developers, your operations people, etc. Find out how they work. Find out what their processes look like. This doesn't have to be a formal process. Go buy them a cup of coffee and, and have a chat over coffee. Be their friends. Don't, don't be those damn security guys over there that are always making us change our code. That's, <clears throat> you can, there are some awesome frameworks out there that you can use to lead yourself into some questions. They, give, they can give you some great ideas for places to start discussing. Um, the two that I really like are OWASP SAM, which is the OWASP uh, software Assurance Maturity Model, and BSIM, which is the Building Security in Maturity Model. They are both freely available resources on the internet, and if you want to get a good idea of where your organization fits in the software assurance, software security life cycle, they're a great place to start. Um, really the key word with both of them though is maturity. <coughs> So, I'm fairly sure that, that most of you, if you work in an at all modern development company or modern company, have heard the term agile. Um, how, many, how many of you work in what considers itself an agile shop? Don't you guys in the middle of our generation? <laughs> Um, okay, and so the rest of you, uh, first off, my condolences, but because you're, it's going to be a lot harder to affect that change if you're not, if folks are at least not already aware of the concept of Agile. So what is Agile? So Agile is a concept that was actually created by a group of folks from other programming paradigms in 2001. Um, it's, it's characterized by a handful of things, namely being a lightweight process, not having a ton of overhead ma in managing it, releasing often, you know, every, every two weeks is sort of the stated goal, 
I know that seems pretty crazy to some of you. Um, it would have seemed absolutely crazy in some of my previous jobs. Human interaction. It's based on the concept that um, you get a lot more done by just going and having a quick conversation with somebody than throwing something over the wall on a ticketing system. That's not to say you're not going to use a ticketing system to track things, but it's human interaction and having conversations, having stand-ups is key. Automation. We're going to get more in automation in a minute. <clears throat> Reflecting on process and learning from mistakes. It, it's not... Agile is not a just coming in, you must do these things. Agile is... There are four ceremonies, they call them ceremonies, I think it's silly, but um, that are sort of core to the concept of Agile. And those are, again, they, some of them seem kind of obvious, but sprint planning, daily stand-ups, which is the one that I'm sure, I know probably five years ago, when somebody said, we want to have a daily meeting for this project, I said, oh, no way. But they're very short meetings. They're called stand-ups for a reason, because you're supposed to stand up. You're supposed to, to keep them short. Um, iteration review. Doing, doing demos and sharing with the other people on the project team what, what you're working on. And then, again, retrospective. That's being aware of the process and looking at what worked right, what went wrong in a cycle, and changing that for next time. Not, not being beholden to, this is the way it should always work. But, again, Agile, many of you may work in workplaces that consider themselves Agile and not necessarily do all those things or do modified version of those things. That's, that's simply how, how Agile works. It's not meant to be a hard, strict measurement of here's how you develop. But the reason I've digressed into Agile is because Agile is really the predecessor to DevOps. And in order to be able to bring a DevOps world into your development life cycle, you need to be aware of Agile. You need to find out what Agile means in your company. So the best way to tackle bringing DevOps in, making your company DevOps enabled, is to be a uniter. In my view, DevOps and Agile are really about three things. Number one, tearing down the silos. So <clears throat> most companies, classic companies, you've got silos. You've got development team over here. You've got operations team over here. You've got security team over here. You might have project managers up here that kind of try and float between the three and do it badly. Um, sorry to any project managers out there. But that's, that's kind of how things are normally divided. In a lot of cases, DevOps is taking those silos and turning them sideways. So that each project has some dev development team members, has some operations team members, and has some security team members who are dedicated to those projects. In general, okay, step two is speeding up the cycle. Like I said, rapid release, doing things on a quicker basis so it's easier to, I mean, we've all been through big bang deployments that you know lasted well into the night. It's not a pretty scene. Nobody wants to do that. Number three, automation. Automation is really the key to what I'm talking about today. So, tearing down silos is hard. It requires organizational change, but you can do it unofficially. So, if your organization is not willing to just jump headfirst into the concept, you can go in and build those project teams organically. You can ask the development teams if you can sit in on their meetings for, for projects, or just their meetings in general. I know we have, nobody wants more meetings, but sometimes. You can say you'll just be a fly on the wall if that's what you have to do. But you don't you don't have to make an organizational sea change. Um, 
because a lot of the development teams will already be having stand-ups. So if you can sit in on those, you can find out what's going on. Same with the operations team. Pull them in, get engaged with those teams. Number two, speeding up. The, it, it really seems counterintuitive. Um, faster development seems like it would lead to less security. But the key is that when you're doing faster development, you're also doing smaller development. You're, you're releasing a lot smaller set of code in each release cycle. And again, it seems like it would require organizational change, but if your dev teams are already agile, they're probably already wishing that the operations and security teams would get on board with this stuff. So that's a, that's a big advantage right there. But you can also speed up slowly and build momentum. Momentum is your friend. As you speed up those release cycles and people see it being a, a success, you will get more engagement with that process. So I've saved the biggest thing for last, automation. Um, Pipelines. So, you, if you if you dive into this world, you'll hear the term pipelines a lot. And basically, that's the idea of that software development lifecycle I talked about earlier being passed all the way up that pipe, that system, that cycle in a pipeline in an automated fashion. So, the goal here is to to stop doing things in a one-off basis to not, not still be building networks and servers manually, not be logging into firewalls and manually configuring firewalls, not being logged into switches, not logging in and you know, install this app on this server and install this other app on this server. <clears throat> so with automation, we can do a lot of that. And if your development teams already have a CI CD pipeline, CI CD, that's continuous integration, continuous deployment, um, if they already have a pipeline, if they're using Jenkins, you, that's, that's a technology you've probably heard of, um, they're, they're Circle CI, you're halfway there because that's, that's a big hurdle. But there are, Jenkins is a free solution, so you can download it and start using it if not. Um, so we're going to start about start talking about what kind of things we want to put in that pipeline. Automated code testing um, is it, huge. You can use tools like Selenium, Watir, Dojo, to encourage your developers to write tests for their applications that can be run in an automated fashion. Because having those tests means that if something, if, if somebody makes a change that breaks a piece of their code, you know, a classic example of this is there was a there was an Apple bug a while back that if you if you entered if you entered the wrong thing in the password field, it would it would unlock the machine. That's something that could absolutely be caught with automated testing, because it was simply somebody had put the wrong variable in the wrong if statement. It, it that's the kind of thing testing is for. Talk to your developers about test driven design, which is writing tests before you write code. It it sounds kind of mind blowing to a lot of people. It also sounds like a lot of work, and it can be, but. If you write the tests and then write the code to make the tests work, then you have automatically saved yourself all that trouble going back and writing those tests, and you know your code works the first time. And then every time that code changes, it can be tested. So as security folks, though, we want to know about testing security testing. You can insert all of these tools for free into that automated pipeline. Um, Arachne and Wapiti are both uh, dynamic scanners for code. Um, Burp Suite, if you're a security person, you can use that. Those can all be inserted into that pipeline and run automatically every time code is checked into the repository. <clears throat> Which again, it allows for massive amounts of automation. Um, OWASP's app is another one that's not on there. Fuzzers, and there are plenty of tools out there that cost a lot of money. Um, <laughs> so, the final thing is that I've got to bring this other buzzword in, but this is really the key to why DevOps is good for security. Because I'm going to talk about the cloud. I'm going to tell you, even as a security guy, that you should look 
to the cloud. But that doesn't necessarily mean the public cloud. You can build your own cloud inside your organization. You can use Docker Swarm or Kubernetes or DCOS to create your own private cloud that brings all of these advantages of DevSecOps to your organization without the scariness of putting all your data in somebody else's computer. Or you can use somebody else's computer. That's, you can do it either way. There's, there's risks and advantages either way. But the great thing about the, the cloud is that you can automate all the components. So you can do what's called creating infrastructure as code, which means that even, even building your entire environment can be done in a code-based fashion so it is repeatable, it is auditable. That code would be in a GitHub repository just like, just like any other or a Git repository, just like any other code. You'd be able to see who changed it. it. There's accountability in place. It's consistent. You don't have to worry about, oh, well, now Jim forgot, Jim got distracted and didn't run these three commands in the build document the last time he built this system. So this, this system's missing these three components. Very much. I know. So infrastructure as code is hugely valuable from a security standpoint because it brings that consistency. It, it removes that human factor from, from the, that human error factor from the process of deploying environments, deploying code. And if you stack all of these components together, all of these pieces into a pipeline, the advantage for security is amazing. So to wrap up, this is why I, as a security person, have, have come to embrace the concept of DevOps, which is something I, even I absolutely poo-pooed several years ago. Because <laughs> if you put all these factors together, if you put together consistency, repeatability, standardization, attributability, and engagement, you have an environment that is a thousand times more secure than if you don't have those components. So it's easy to get lost in the idea that security should be its own silo out there, um, that making these big changes is hard, but you can make these changes within your organization just by communicating and working with those, working with the other people in your organization. It doesn't have to be a turning the ship around change. It can be a gradual change that makes a huge difference. So. That's that's my talk. Um, any questions? Anything I can answer? Yes. So, for the DevOps teams, how do you avoid new technology most of the time? Because that seems like DevOps is bringing all these new technologies. So, DevOps does bring in a lot of new technologies. Um, the, the challenge is not just bringing in every new technology because it's new, and making sure you take a controlled uh, model of technologies in. That's, that's really the big challenge. You know, every DevOps person I've worked with, oh, we got this other new thing, let's bring that in. Well, gradual, again. Let, let them bake. You use established technologies. So, okay, I think I'm probably getting run out of here. So, 